Now, the, of course, uh, Nigeria's president, Bola Metinbo, on Tuesday, that's the 1st of October, announced the convocation of a national youth conference. He said the conference will be a platform to address the diverse challenges and opportunities confronting our young people. Of course, according to the president, who constitute more than 60% of the entire population. The president added that the conversations would unite young persons to collaboratively develop solutions to issues such as education, employment, innovation, security, and social justice. Now, reactions have, of course, started pouring in. While some see this as a laudable initiative, some others see it as a total waste of time and resources. Now, joining me on today's show to discuss this is Sam Johanna. Is the immediate past organizing secretary that's uh, for the APC, uh, Kaduna State. He joins virtually. Also, Abjido Ojo is a public affairs analyst who also joins virtually from Abuja. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. It's my pleasure. All right, let me. Thank you, Mr. Dabo. Great, great to have you, gentlemen. Let me start uh, with uh, some of the reactions that have started uh, greeting this initiative by the president. Um, one of them, uh, of such reactions, is uh, the reaction by the Human Rights Writers Association of Nigeria. Uh, that's Riwa, describing it as wasteful and an ineffective exercise designed to deflect attention from the government's failures. I'll start off with you, Jideo Ojo. The idea for a national youth conference, is that you know, a step in the right direction? Thank you, Gapo. Um, it, it's, as you say, yes, it's, it's a step in the right direction because, as the popular saying goes, it's better to judge other than to war war. Uh, more so that the youth uh, are protesting. Uh, we saw protests yesterday. We saw protests on uh, between August 1 and 10th this year. So the restiveness of Nigerian youth is becoming palpable and apparent. And I think the president just wants to give them opportunities to come up with workable solutions. Uh, don't forget, the um, more often than not, uh, the youth of today are very find it very easy to castigate the leaders of yesteryears. They claim that they are the ones that have ruined this country. They have lost touch with reality. They do not have. Um, uh, Technological, uh, they don't, they, they are not tech savvy. That means they are not technologically savvy. Uh, they, they are not in tune with modern realities. So if they are now having the opportunity to discuss how they want the future of Nigeria to, uh, how they want the future of Nigeria to go, I think it's a welcome development. However, however, the point is. As I noted in my column in the punch today, that this will not be another jamboree. Uh, like we had uh, some um, uh, 10 years ago, when uh, Good Lord Jonathan, former president Good Lord Jonathan, organized a 12 billion Naira national conference with six, 600 you know, um, recommendations and none of it implemented not by good luck Jonathan himself or by the successive administration after that. After all, we have had Tinubu, we have had the Gwari administration after after good luck Jonathan for eight years. He didn't touch the uh, report of the conference and then we we fought Tinubu for 16 months. He also haven't looked in the direction of the National Confab report. So the fear of those who are castigating and said this may be a deflection from reality is a genuine fear, which I also have. But on the face of it, I think it's a welcome development to allow the use of Nigeria to convoke and, and find a workable solution to the problem of, of the country. Mm. Let me go to Sam uh, Johanna on this one. Now, Sam, I mean, the All Progressives Congress, which of course is your party, uh, reactions on, on this matter uh, uh, has it that um, for many Nigerians who feel, okay, uh, talking about inclusivity, this might be a part for some, 
it's a total waste of time, given the fact that um, this is not the first time we are seeing national conferences, just like what Jide Ojo has said, uh, happen. But at the end of the day, they end up being white elephant uh, gatherings with nothing to show for it. Is this another, uh, you know, uh, effort in futility? Thank you for having me. No, I don't think so. Uh, like uh, Mr. Jide Ojo has said, this uh, youth conference is long overdue, uh, going by some of the campaign promises that uh, our party made the All Progressive Congress during our campaigns. We, we promised the youth that if we're elected, we will carry them along. And if we look into this present uh, Fair Executive uh, Council, the cabinet, you will find out that about 15 to 20 percent are people within the range of 30, 45. And I think this is the first time in recent time that we're having a whole ministry They've been uh, uh, given to the youth, where you have uh, Dr. Jamila Bidu as the Minister of Youth and uh, the Junior Minister there. All these are uh, uh, people that are less than uh, the, the 35, 40, 40, uh, 35. So, and uh, you see, like in your preamble, you said 60% of the population of this country are the youths. And if they are not carried along, I tell you, we might have a difficult challenge ahead coordinating them. So, this is a welcome development by the president. But, however, 30 days for a national youth conference, it's a long, 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 long time. Because uh, the whole month is going to go on that. And uh, with uh, technology now, you, you, you don't need to, I mean, have that kind of long distance gathering them in one place. Uh, though we don't know how they intend uh, going about the youth conference. If they're going to do it region by region or state by state. Okay, because I, I, I was about coming in to ask that, I mean, you said that part of uh, the promises, you know, your party did make is carrying young people along. I was about asking, yes. uh, in that direction, how do you intend to carry the youth along, you know, in this conference? What's the selection uh, process like? What's the model like? How can the average young Nigerian who wants to be a part of it you know, uh, join in? Because for many, they feel maybe it will just be another APC uh, youth convention where you just see, you know, a cross-session of APC members, you know, as uh, uh, attendees or participants in that event. Well, for now, I don't have an idea how the screening process or how they're going to pick participants uh, for the conference. But I think the Minister of uh, youth will play a very important role since they are saddled with the, the responsibility of, I mean, coordinating the youth. So we will wait and see in a couple of days how uh, it will play out. But I'm sure it will not be like a previous way of people bringing uh, their relatives, their younger ones, their distant. I, I just think it should be more robust and more transparent way of, I mean, getting participants that will uh, uh, attend this uh, conference and get people that really, really will, uh, will want to get value from the conference. Uh, we understand that in the past, so many shenanigans have happened where the, the recruitment process or the screening process or how people come for conferences, you just see, I mean, sentiments will play in. I, I don't think sentiment uh, would be part of this now because honestly, the youth are really, really uh, very, very uh, angry and upset because if you see the role they play, whenever, whenever there's a protest or this thing, you will know that these people are almost being pushed to the wall. So this is an opportunity now to, I mean, bring them close and uh, feel their pulse and see how uh, we can move forward with them. But like I always say, uh, it's, it's, it's work in progress. Mm. All right, let, let me go back to uh, GD, Mr. GD Ojo on this. I, I would like you to speak on the duration, 30 days for a conference. Um, that, that's pretty an extensive time, 30 days. I mean, given the fact that, I mean, that, that there's technology that can maybe even allow for a wider reach or range and maybe even shorter days. I'd like you to react to that. And let's uh, digress also a bit to speak on 
uh, one pivotal issue, you know, um, that has uh, affected or that is affecting a lot of young people, and that is the jackpot syndrome. Now, according to the Nigerian Immigration Service, uh, it disclosed uh, that about 3.6 million Nigerians migrated to other countries within two years. That's uh, from 2022 to 2023. Now, the reason for this uh, largely economic hardship and further studies, we know that that further studies, uh, many of them use that as a platform to uh, sort of uh, transit to. Now, how do you think a conference like this would address this very pivotal issue? Okay, so uh, two in one. But my, my own take is this, um, 30 days may look long, but it's not really very long. Um, we wait for the modus operandi of how this to be uh, done. Um, when we see the schedule of activities, it will see whether we'll be able to adjudge uh, whether this is um, something that is uh, worthy of being done within 30 days. My own reservation is just about the timing, uh, given the fact that right now, electoral and constitutional reform is ongoing. And um, memorandum has been submitted, uh, and uh, the, the work is at advanced stage, which means that more or less, um, depending on whether we want to, uh, the president will want this convocation of the National Youth Conference to be held in 2024 given that this is the last quarter of the year, and um, uh, we barely have this month and next month uh, to wind down the year. Um, usually, you can't have a national conference in December. Uh, December is usually half, half a month uh, before people travel for, for, for Christmas and New Year. So uh, we look forward to uh, how the modalities will be. But uh, by and large, I think, uh, if, if this could be wrapped up before the end of the year, and then the suggestions for those that will need legal reform can feed into the constitutional alteration um, that is going on, that, that, will, that, will be, that will be okay. More so, compared to that of uh, Good Lord Jonathan, which took place on the eve of election, uh, this conference is, is being arranged uh, a, a year into the this administration, which then means that uh, you you may not the Tinubu administration may not be able to get the political mileage that uh, that he will have gotten if he were to organize this in 2026. But that's on the on the on one side. On the other side of Jakpa, I think we should just be very careful how we. Uh, how we characterize uh, issue of migration. Uh, globally, uh, people migrate for different reasons. Um, it, it may not even be for economic hardship. Do you know the number of Indians and Chinese that are outside the shores of their country? Do you know how many millions they are? Uh, Do you know how many uh, other countries are in, in other parts of the world? I think we, we, there are benefits to Japan, and if we address the benefits uh, uh, very well, uh, it may actually rub up positively on us. Okay, wow. Um, that, that, because if, if... That's an interesting yes. approach to it. But I, I think we'll uh, come back to that because I'm pretty much interested on the benefits to the jackpot syndrome that we are currently experiencing in the country. But let's go on a quick ad break. When we return, we will pick up. Do stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us. This is still Politics HQ on New Central Television. And today we are looking at uh, the issue around the National Youth Conference that was announced by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu yesterday during his uh, national address. I still have my guest with me, Judo Ojo, a public affairs analyst who is joining virtually from Abuja. And also uh, Sam Yohana, who is, of course, uh, the former, uh, that uh, immediate past organizing secretary of the APC Kaduna State who's also joining virtually. Thank you for staying with me, gentlemen. Now, quickly, Jide Ojo, before we went on that break, you were talking about uh, JAKPA, and you said there is an upside to it if Nigeria nurses yes. it. So I, I would like you to speak more on that. And uh, you were trying to also do a comparative uh, analysis as to uh, what 
is obtainable, why people will migrate in places like China, you know, and other parts of the world compared to what we have here. But according to the Immigration Service, it said that uh, the reason, largely in the case of Nigeria, is economic hardship and further studies. So I, I would like you to put that in context to, you know, your analysis. So, so again, um, even if you use just benchmarks, uh, what's happening in the whole uh, South, uh, Southern America? Uh, the the Mexicans, the Ecuadorians, the uh, Argentinians, and the rest of them that are, are migrating to U.S. Venezuelans. I'm not I'm not by any stretch of imagination saying that it's a welcome development, but there is a positive side to it. Uh, the one that is condemnable is irregular migration. That's when you have to go through the desert through the Atlantic Ocean and irregularly migrate to Europe or to any other part of the world. But in terms of, uh, you know, voluntarily leaving the country uh, to, to seek greener pasture elsewhere, uh, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, there are so many people who are just dissatisfied with their jobs. I, I, I know of people, it, it's not even necessarily because of economic hardship. Uh, my neighbor in the, where I live, here in Abuja, uh, he decided to relocate with his family to 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 Canada. It's not it's not like he was he was jobless here. He was a manager with a multinational company, and he decided that well he wants a better life. And and it is it's an aspiration anybody could have. But when you look at the remittances that is coming from the diaspora, uh, it's a, it's one one thing that India has leveraged on. It's one thing that China has leveraged on. Uh, it's one thing that many other countries have leveraged on the remittance from their diaspora to, to rebuild their country. And I think we are not doing sufficiently enough. Uh, we, are not, we are not even tracking those remittances and how we can use that to, uh, to, to, to positively on, on the country's economy. And then we have left the, the Nigerians and diaspora for too long out of our political, uh, political scene. Um, they, are, they do not have right to vote, and I think that is unfortunate because, given their economic contributions to this country, uh, they should the right to vote should be extended to them. And um, I was on NTA recently, and we learned that uh, for national uh, NIN, that's like the national identification number. Uh, NIN was able to open offices across in uh, across uh, seventy countries around the world. Why? Why if we if we can open seventy uh, offices of uh, NIMSI across the world to, to register Nigerians, why can't we register them to also vote? But more or less, um, I think we could leverage on this japa uh, to 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 also incentivize these people who have left to come back if we are able to create the enabling environment. Um, just There was a trending video in the course of last week of a doctor who, who has spent 25 years in the US and who voluntarily decided to come back to Nigeria uh, to, to, to apply his trade there. Uh, don't forget the bank uh, and, and his, uh, and his uh, business partner and what's the DJ, um, Don uh, Jazzy. The, I believe the you're, you're referring to Don um, Jazzy. What's that? Don Jazzy. Yeah, Don Jazzy. Uh huh. They, they, they voluntarily came back from UK. They were based I mean, in UK uh, before. Uh, uh, your your point, your point is made. Your, people... your point is made. If if I'm to come in here, your point is uh, of course uh, put well. Uh, that uh, but again, those are one-off scenarios. I mean, some questions that you would also want to ask is what is the ease of doing business in the country at the moment? What are the policies like? Are they business friendly? Then even according to the MBS, I mean, if you look at uh, the unemployment rate, the underemployment, and even youth employment, I'm seeing 10.6% uh, underemployed, you know, Nigerians. I mean, the, the margin has even expanded given the current economic situation, whereby the value of the Naira, the purchasing power of the Naira right now has further dipped. So, I mean, these are pretty much obvious indicators as to why an average Nigerian might look at it and say, you know what, let me leave the country. Maybe I should leave you for a moment and go to uh, Johanna and get his thoughts on this. Mr. Dakbo. I'm with you. 
All right. Uh, like I always tell my friends, there's nothing wrong with Japa, but make sure that when you're Japa, you're going there for a genuine reason and you'll be shuttling between Nigeria and wherever you are Japa to because we also need skills and other things from where you've gone to because. Uh, I have a couple of friends for some time now that have spent some time overseas and now they've resulted to shuttling between Nigeria and wherever they are overseas. And they come with a lot of value. Anytime they come to Nigeria, they come in with a new innovation and there are a couple of things we're doing with them. And I see the difference in what they do before they left Nigeria and now that they started shuttling between Nigeria and the country, the 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 the, the Japa too. So uh, Mr. Jire was saying that uh, a National Identity Management Agency Commission NIMS had open offices in overseas. Yes. Do you know that most of the leading political parties in Nigeria they have party members overseas, where they have offices, political party offices overseas. I know of APC in diaspora. I know of PDP in diaspora. Uh, for Labour Party, I don't know if they have uh, offices in diaspora. So if they can have political party offices in diaspora, they should be able to vote during election. So I expect the constitutional reform that is going on, they should make provision for people living in diaspora to be able to vote when the general election comes. Because honestly, they have a law they are bringing to us, and they have a law they are adding value to us. Because I remember during the campaign during our campaign in 2023 i saw a lot of people from diaspora apc members i came they campaigned with us all over the country during the inauguration they were with us at eagle square so you see this shows that they already have a structure there that what is required won't be too much to see that they are integrated to start voting from overseas. But but, do, sure but does nigeria have the wherewithal in terms of infrastructural you know, capability in terms of logistics. Because even our local elections here, that is that doesn't involve diaspora members, we see people after elections troop to tribunals and court endlessly. We've not been able to get that right. Do we have the capacity to you, accommodate people, do you, you know, abroad? Do you know why you see a lot of people troop to tribunal, election petition tribunals after election? A lot of, a lot of politicians who have are bad losers. Somebody knows he has a bad case. He sits with his lawyer, and the lawyer tells him that, look, let's go to the tribunal. Let's try our luck. You see cases, they overflow the courts with cases. Even after they've lost at the lower court, at the election petition, they will still go to court of appeal, like for election uh, posts that uh, can go to court of appeal, like the Senate, State Assembly, House of Reps. But for, for, for governorship and the presidential goes up to uh, the Supreme Court. So you see, even when you know that you you you, you have no time of the court, I mean overstretch the judges, and, and at the end of the day, if we remember some of the judgment that the judges deliver, they will tell you that look, next time they will tell the counsel of the appeal and the next time. The time of the court so we, we don't want this kind of thing so we the politicians we have to learn how to accept defeat in good faith because honestly some of us like i said earlier are bad losers they don't want to lose they and you see in the game of politics there are three things that happen there it's either you lose or you win or you don't participate in the in the election so i want my fellow politicians to imbibe that let them know that it's not always that you have to win Mm. Life is full of up and down. You win some, you lose some. So I tell them, let's, let, I mean, accept, when we lose elections, we should accept defeat. For the electoral umpire, I'd expect them also to step up their game. Because if you see most complaints after election now, like 50% of the blame goes to the electoral umpire. So if they really want to put things in, in, in perspective, and I mean, it's a, a robust uh, infrastructure, they can conduct elections overseas. They can conduct elections overseas. All right, Sam, Joanna, thank you for that. We need to go on another break. When we, of course, come back, we will be looking at how some of the economic uh, policies are currently affecting the average Nigerian youth. Do stay with us.
Many thanks for staying with us. This is Still Politics HQ on News Central Television. And of course, we are looking at the youth, uh, National Youth Conference, which was announced uh, by the, or proposed by the president just yesterday in his nationwide address. The impact of this on the Nigerian youth is what we are considering, and we still have with us Jido Ojo, a public affairs analyst, joining virtually from Abuja, and also Sam Yohana, who is also uh, joining virtually from Kaduna. Gentlemen, thank you for staying with me. Now, let's uh, look at uh, this, uh, some of the economic policies of the current administration and the impact it has had on the ease of doing business, particularly for young persons. We know that for, I mean, since the uh, introduc introduction of uh, this policies, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, the full uh, subsidy removal and uh, also the Naira, uh, of course, unification amongst a list of other policies. We've seen standard of uh, living, you know, skyrocket, and then the ease of doing business, you know, become really, really intense. I, I was just reeling out some statistics uh, right now where you have Many young persons who are, yes, employed, but are underemployed. Reason being that what they earn is not even enough to take them by for, for you know, the entire month. And so I'd like you to speak on that. I'll start with you, Mr. Jide Ojo. These economic policies of the current administration on the average Nigerian youth, how do you perceive it? Again, as I've noted in my commentary in, the, in today's um, Punch newspapers. Um, this is very unwholesome and unwelcome development. Um, the president, I don't know why he feels and stubbornly insists that there are no alternatives to uh, first subsidy removal and the floating of the Naira. Because, as you have rightly pointed out, the purchasing power parity of Nigerian currency is next to nothing. Uh, even if you have a living wage, what you buy is practically uh, what, what you buy with 100,000 today was what you buy with 10,000 naira uh, before this admission comes to, came to power on May 29. And I'm just I'm not joking. Um, this morning I wanted to buy a bottle of uh, a bottle of uh, uh, what's it called? Cashew nuts. And the supermarket where I wanted to buy it, uh, you know, the price tag is 8500 Just a bottle. I mean, this is what we buy Sorry, for, you said a bottle of cashew nuts. nuts. A bottle of cashew nuts. You saw it for, yes. for 8000 Yes. 8500 so Is it imported? Is, it's is, not. I, I mean, I'm talking of... Is it coated in gold? <laughs> In fact, I can show. Do you want me to show you? Do you want me <laughs> Maybe to show before you? the show ends, we'll be interested in seeing what the bottle looks no, like. No. <laughs> this is it. This is it. This is, this is it. 8,000 naira. This is the book. 8,500 naira. 8,500. Wow. There's nothing important about this. So, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that the, the cost of living is so high that even if you hand Purportedly living wage, you you cannot survive on it. Uh, the cost of rent has increased, cost of fuel has increased, cost of um, uh, uh, school fees has increased. Virtually everything, and then that's why I said I, I said the president is listening too much to the Bretton Wood institutions, IMF and the World Bank. That I do I don't know whether you read a couple of days back. World Bank is about to loan us another one point five billion dollars. Yes, I, I saw it. That, that's what that's what I saw. So we and the, the, you know these loans are with conditions attached. They will tell you before you get this loan, you have to remove subsidies. You have to de de devalue your currency. Now, Naira has been so devalued that it's almost turning to Zimbabwean dollar many years ago. And the, it's not only the youth. Even though the focus of this, uh, the focus of this, of this um, uh, discussion is on the Nigerian youth. Even uh, some of us who are who are above that age bracket are, are badly affected. I, as I speak with you, I'm owing millions in naira in debt because to pick, to keep up with your responsibility, I don't know unless you are doing Yahoo 
or you are you are a politician who who who, who, who controls budgets. I'm not sure whether there's anyone among my ranks of people who wanted to live with integrity that will not be boring to, to, to augment whatever the little they, they get. So the point I'm trying to make is that I, you are very spot on with the issue of ease of doing business. In my column today, I was asking the, the pertinent question. Um, the nano, small, and medium enterprises that government said is going to incentivize. Uh, how many have been, uh, how many beneficiaries do we have? The issue of consumer credit scheme, there was nothing in that speech, 22 minutes speech, that speaks to that. And that's something that government said they budgeted 200 billion for in the president's August for uh, um, uh, broadcast. So when, when people, young people, want to just employ themselves, they want to to, to create something for themselves to do. You find out that their effort is, is like a, passing, uh, a, a, a common passing through the eye of the needle. Because if you want to loan money, look at, look at the, um, just last week, Central Bank of Nigeria decided to increase the uh, MPC monetary and um, the interest rate to 27.5%. If you are, and that, that's official, if you are going to borrow from a money deposit bank, you are going to, the, the benchmark is 27.5%. By the time the commercial banks put their own administrative charges on it, you will be looking at something between 30 to 35% as interest rate. But go and keep money in the bank. You'll be lucky to get 1% on, as interest on your savings. And that's why the economy does not encourage any savings. And to loan money now to start a business is like you are just doing yourself a world I mean, of Mr. Adido, because... uh, let, let, let's, let's bring in Johanna. I mean, you said uh, keeping your money in the bank and then at the end of the day, charges will just wipe it off. In, uh, I mean, ironically, uh, most of these accounts, you would understand them to be savings accounts. So you ask yourself, I, are they really saving my money or spending it on my behalf? I mean, probably that's a conversation for another day. But let me come to Joanna on this one. Now, talking about young people, you're laughing. <laughs> talking about young people and, you know, this economic policies, the ease of doing business. We know a lot of young people run online businesses. I mean, if you go online right now to check, a lot of them are reviewing their prices. That's young persons doing business. Now, aside that, on a lighter note, um, when you have conversations with bachelors, and I'm talking about veteran bachelors now, people that have refused to get married, a lot of them will tell you that it's due to the economic situation in the country. So I'd like you to speak on how these policies by the current administration is affecting young persons and their decisions. You know, you asked me why I like it. You know why I laughed? I'm with it's you. A bottle of cashino, it's a bottle of cashino Mr. Judo, Judo Ojo brought and displayed on the script that he had to spend 8500 <laughs> to buy this. Anyway, he's in the Federal Capital Territory of Abuja. I bought that cashino in Kaduna three days ago for 5000 naira. That's so still I expensive. I'm to have gotten it here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, quick one. Uh, you see, this is my personal opinion. You see, the president made some... Uh, pronouncements, closely pronouncements, I think the first two or three weeks he became president. You see, that pronouncement he made at Eagle Square, that subsidy had been removed. As a member of the ruling party, I'm saying it here, he ought not to have done that diet. Reason because if I were to be in his shoes, even if I'm going to remove the subsidy, I would not remove it completely at once. And I'll make sure that before I remove the subsidy, one or two local refineries would have started producing petroleum products. By the time he removes, let's say, okay, first remover will be 50%. Maybe those refineries are producing at 20, 30, 40% installed capacity. Your argument, for that percentage I remove. After like six months, I'll remove another 25%. Mm. 
You see, before I remove all, I'll make sure that two or three domains, a local refinery, will start working. And you see, the pain will not be as severe as what we are going through. It's like somebody has malaria, and the doctor prescribed injection for four days. And eventually, instead of taking the injection for four days, he took all the injection in a day. What do you think will happen to him? So, uh, floating the Naira, already subsidy has been removed. Another pain Nigerians are going through. Not too long, the Naira was devalued by close to 200%. So, two very cash policy within a space of one or two months. And up to today, Nigerians have not recovered from these two policies. Let me tell you, as I speak to you now, a lot of people that work in a low-income outfit or offices have started resigning their job because what they've been paid goes on transport. They even have to borrow and add to see that they cover for the month. So they say, why am I even going to work now? So my advice to the president, and I'm sure if, he, if, he's, not, if he's not watching us, people close to him are watching us. Let him please some of this policy come with a human pace. Mm. They are very fantastic policies, very nice policies. Because if there is no pain, there is no gain. A lot of mistakes were done in the previous regime, the middle past regime. So this regime is correcting some of those mistakes. But honestly, Mr. Dapo, the pain is severe. So moving to chronic bachelors that are long overdue to get married. In fact, him working and getting salary cannot even take care of him alone. Not talk of bringing another man's daughter into his house. And you know, when you bring in a woman, a woman is on an asset too. You are bringing in a liability because you're going to be spending on her. The recurrent expenditures you'll be spending on her. So, once some of these policies are reviewed, honestly, I see a lot of opportunities. Mm. And I'll be glad if that will be done in good time. Already, the energy crisis. All right. Now, if within a month, whether you like it or not, if you have a car, you will spend nothing less than 20,000 to 30,000 euros to fuel your car. If you use gas to cook in your house, a 12.5 kg of cooking gas is 15,500 here in Chaduna. I don't know how that please. Is it electricity? That one is another distance now, but an A. There's this man in Paracot that said they had to come and disconnect his hospital because they were bringing bill every month for him for like 3.5 million naira. So at the end of the day, he told them, no, 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 we can't go like this, we can't run the hospital. All right. In the process of negotiating, he said, before you know what happened, they came and disconnected. And so patients were on life support at that time. All right. So you can imagine. All of this effect. I understand that we yes. really need to go on another break. Of course, when we come back, we will pick up. Do stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us. Of course, you are watching Politics HQ on New Central Television. I still have my guest with me, Jide Ojo, a public affairs analyst, who, of course, is joining virtually, and also Sam Yohanna, who is also joining virtually. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Now, let's uh, digress uh, slightly before we bring the show to a close and talk about something. This actually spurred you know, me to ask the question because you talked about uh, uh, the subsidy regime removal. And that brings me to a report I saw today that uh, the Portacot refinery misses a seventh deadline restart. We know that there has been talks and promises around uh, the start of the Portacot refinery, which is a state-owned refinery. I, I mean, my question to you, Johanna, is this. I'm still also going to ask Jide Ojo, what, what do you think is going on? Uh, Mr. Dabo, if you remember, a couple of months ago, the, the NMPC GMD, personal military, was at the National Assembly. The statement he made there, he said, we're not liars. We're not here to deceive people. We know what is happening. When the time comes, we'll tell Nigerians what is happening. So we're still waiting for him to tell us what is happening. There are things happening that me and you, a lot of Nigerians, are not previewed to know. So we're waiting for Melikia to tell us. 
Maybe that's why this is the seventh time they're reviewing. If you check the news now, most of those TV stations now, you see scrolling at Potaco Refinery to resume production in September. And all this news bar scrolling, um, it's, it's a way of telling me that this September you told us we still have it in mind, we're waiting for it. Now we're in October, so we don't know what he's going to tell us now. Honestly, a lot of Nigerians are disappointed in the state-owned uh, oil company. Because we have the likes of them in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco, that has been declaring profit, running to billions of dollars. We have Petrobras in Brazil. So, so I, I see no reason why the one in Nigeria has become like, I mean, a magic to work. Mm. So, the, like I said, the president too has to really call uh, the GMB or NPC to order the Minister of State for Petroleum. He, the president to the, the Minister of Petroleum, had a lot to explain to Nigerians what is happening. Because we're waiting. Now Dangote is fully up running. We can't see Dangote's product in the market. God knows why the, the product had not hit the market. So, so honestly, like someone said some few days ago, how can you have four wives in your house? Then you're looking outside to a side chick. Well, mm -hmm. you can't take care of the four. Well, what do you want to do with the side chick outside? So you can see it becoming mockery now. People are even mocking their NMPs. So uh, honestly, all right, I, I, as I speak now, I, I can't say anything about it because even me, I'm lost. Uh, all right, um, let me throw the question to uh, Jideo Joe. Jideo Joe, I mean, seventh deadline miss, you know, of the restart of the Potakot refinery. Shouldn't heads have rolled? Exactly, shouldn't have rolled. Um, I, I, did a, I did an article last year where I, I quoted the Guardian newspaper that we have spent a total of 25 billion on turnaround maintenance of our four refineries, and none of them is functional. And yet we have staff who are earning fast salaries, earning allowances, and getting promoted for doing nothing in these small refineries, just like the case of Ajaguta still rolling really in, where people work, and yet they are not productive, but they get paid, they get promoted, and they get retirement benefits. And a lot of people have said that many carriers should have gone, but I think the problem goes beyond Melikiari. Melikiari is just like the poster boy. He's just like a errand boy for the cabal. And I, I, I think there is a political angle to this, so uh, the final is not working. Recall that um, a blogger, uh, a journalist really, uh, based in the U.S., uh, I think, what, what is his name? Uh, forgotten his name now. He said he was being recruited to demonize uh, Dangote refineries uh, by some international uh, agency. I believe you uh, might be referring to David Dudain. Uh, David Dudain, David David God bless you. David Dudain came out to say he was being uh, promised 800,000 naira to write an uh, article to demonize uh, Dangote refinery. And, and that's to tell you the dimension, international dimensions. The international companies that doesn't want us to be off importation of oil will not will not make refineries to work in Nigeria. And if you have listened that, but to uh, Obaso just recent interview, when he was told that these refineries are just dead like Dodo and should be sold off, and he decided to do it in his tenor, unfortunately, Nigeria labor unions are among the culprits who insisted that uh, the regime of uh, the, the, the administration of Omaru uh, Musa Yaga should rescind that decision. That the, the, the refinery had already been sold to Blue Star Consortium, then owned by Dan Gote or Tedola and a few others. Okay. If they have allowed that sale to go at that time in 2007, we will have cut our loss. Unfortunately, this labor union. I wish I could, I, I, could, I could tell them to their faces, and I hope they are watching now, that sometimes when these labor unions are insisted on a particular line of action and the government refused to toe their line, it may, be, it may be in the national interest. Because they were part of those who insisted that, that, that the Blue Star Consortium must be refunded for the sale of this refinery. If we have sold it way back in 2007, we would have cut our loss, Dangote will not have needed to build a fresh one at $20 billion. And you could see the, the conspiracy against Dangote refinery even as we speak. According to, to, to him, 
the international oil companies are selling crude oil to him about three to four dollars above the uh, the the price, the international price, just to frustrate him. Mm. And that that is why uh, we need to look beyond the economy of why protocol is not working. It is there is a political uh, uh, dimension to it. Those whom we are importing or we are sending our crude oil to, to refine, they know that they are, their companies will show them the moment we are self-sufficiency in, in refining our petroleum products. And they want to continue to make us dry. And the president, unfortunately, All right, I'm sorry. the president who is also the minister of petroleum resources, perhaps have not seen this political dimension as to warranting taking the firm action against the, uh, the the contractors who got this 1.5 billion ton of maintenance of potato refineries and yet keep delaying on the on the on the on the completion date of that project all right Gide Ojo, thank you so much but i understand that we really need to go now gentlemen thank you so much for your time on the program i deeply appreciate your moments uh, and of course your thoughts and uh, opinions thank you once again that was Gide Ojo there thank you for having us. great Jideo Joe there, public affairs analyst, uh, of course, uh, joining virtually from Abuja and also Sam Johanna. Sam Johanna is actually the, uh, at some point, he was the past immediate uh, uh, youth secretary for the APC in Kaduna State. Gentlemen, I'd like to also once again appreciate you. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode. In case you missed out, you can actually catch up, you know, on our YouTube platform. That's at uh, News Central TV. You can also follow us across social media platforms with the same name, News Central Television. You can follow me personally at Dakmo, at Digboya, across social media. Until I come your way again tomorrow, good night.